We are in a war, whether we realize it or not. And today I've got a very special guest with me. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce him. But his book, Slaying Dragons, A Practical Guide to Spiritual Warfare by Daniel Kalenda. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, spiritual warfare from a very practical way. I mean, the spiritual warfare is something that is it's it can be very confusing to a lot of people, but he has a very practical approach and is going to help us understand how we have power over the evil one. And uh, just everybody, can, so you can know, my charisma shop is where you got to go to get the copy of this book. But without any further ado, here is uh, Daniel Kalenda. Uh, welcome to Charisma Connections. It's great to be able to have you here. Thanks, John. It's good to see you again. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> Daniel is my pastor uh, at Nations Church, and uh, so I get to hear him preach in person uh, quite a bit, which I really, really enjoy. And uh, we're in a, you just opened a great series. Uh, I really enjoyed the first week of that, and I know we've got a couple more weeks uh, comparing, uh, was it Luke 5 and, and John 21? And, yeah, very good. Um, <laughs> Man, just the the things that God is revealing to you and that you're able to share with us is is really beneficial. But today we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare, and um, you do a, you deal a lot with that, especially on the mission field where you see it more in uh, it's more evident. But spiritual warfare is everywhere. Yeah. Um, but uh, could you just talk a little bit about uh, Christ for All Nations and what you do as a missionary evangelist? Yeah, I'd love to do that, uh, John. Thank you. Um, you know, I am a evangelist, which for those that don't really know what that means, I, I preach the gospel. It's a very simple job. I very often am traveling around the world to, to places. You know, I'm a missionary evangelist, so I, I go very often to unreached places. I go to the third world. We do large scale crusades. Um, I'm the successor of a man by the name of Reinhard Bonnke, who was arguably one of the, the greatest evangelists that ever lived, certainly yeah. of our generation in our lifetime. And we've seen up to this point from 1987 until today, we've seen over 88 million documented decisions for Christ, mostly in these super gigantic gospel crusades that we do in Africa and around the world. And so, you know, I've, I've preached to a million people at one time. I'm talking about on a million people on one field. It's crowds stretching as far as the eye can see. And when you do something like that, there is an impact that's made on a region that is really profound. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, imagine a, a place where the entire population or two thirds or 90 percent of the population in many cases is in one service and they hear the gospel together and they see miracles together. I mean, it really shakes the place and it has a way of uh, transforming regions. But also at the same time, it has the potential to really stir up the enemy. And that's both in the natural and obviously in the spiritual world the, the enemy is not happy about what we're doing. And so um, spiritual warfare for us is not theoretical. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. sit down to write this book in a library at a university with a, with a pile of uh, academic resources next right. to me, just kind of copying and pasting and putting footnotes in. I, I wrote this from the trenches. I wrote this on the field, you know, with dusty shoes and, with the, the African in the African heat and, you know, having just come off the, the platform, preaching the gospel, casting out devils, um, dealing with witch doctors. I mean, the, the kind of things that we, we deal with on a daily basis are, are quite extraordinary, but the principles that allow us to have victory over the enemy in those very dramatic contexts are the very same principles, believe it or not, that allow a believer to have victory over the enemy in very mundane, ordinary parts of their lives. Because, Spiritual warfare is not just something for crusade evangelists who preach in Africa. It is actually the description. It's a biblical description of the life of a believer in Jesus. The Apostle Paul says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So what Paul is trying to communicate to us is that we are in a, we are in a war, whether we understand that or not. You know, there's a lot of Christians that say, well, I don't want to get involved in spiritual warfare. Well, listen, the moment that you put your faith in Christ and you put on the uniform of a Christian, you are drafted into the army of God. And that's not some weird thing. That's not a spooky thing. It just means that you have set yourself up as the antithesis of all that is the enemy. 
So you now mm -hmm. represent the kingdom of God. You represent the goodness of God, the light, the life of, of the kingdom of heaven. And so as a result, you are a target in this spiritual war. And so, it, you know, whether, like I said, you're, you're in the war, whether you know it or not. Right. But if you don't know it, you may be actually falling into uh, traps of the enemy and you might be succumbing to the enemy without even realizing it. That's why the Apostle Paul also says that we are not ignorant of the enemy's devices. It's, it's very important for us as soldiers in this battle to understand that we're in the battle, to understand how it's being fought, to understand how the enemy is trying to trap us and trick us. And, and very often it has to do with our, our thoughts and our thinking patterns. And if we understand what's going on, then it allows us to be better equipped to fight back and to do Amen. what's necessary to be victorious. So that's in a nutshell kind of what I do and how spiritual warfare plays a part in that. Yeah, and one of the things that I love about being a, being connected with uh, Christ for All Nations and, and Nations Church is the fact that we get to see testimonies and hear testimonies on a weekly basis of these massive amounts of people around the world that are coming to Christ through the CFAN uh, Evangelism Alliance and just all these people in so many different countries all the time. And we hear amazing stories. Um, a couple, I guess a year or so ago, um, I had read the Reinhard Bonnke's book um, the, about his about his life, the uh, Living a Life of Fire. And one of the stories that was told in that book was about a, a place I forget where in Africa you, you probably better help me out here, um, where they actually like shut down a uh, one of his crusades. But the um, but God just brought into uh, restoration with a recent outreach one of those cities that said, please come back. They hadn't seen blessing. Could you, could you yep. just kind of, you know what story I'm talking about? It was really um, cool because I, I read that in the book and then I heard a completion of a testimony of that at church. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, there's several um, stories that are similar to what you're talking sure. about. The, the one that I think you might be referencing is that in the city of Jinja in, uh, in Uganda, I believe we had a crusade where this is many years ago. This is probably 25 years ago or something like that. We had a crusade where um, the governor of the city basically blocked our crusade after we had already arrived. We've, we've, we'd had permission to come and do the crusade. And then he, he blocked it and he shut down the meeting and um, ran. Basically, I wasn't a part of the team at that time, but he ran Evangelist Bonke out of town. And it was the only time in Reinhardt's, you know, 40 some years of ministry that he said he actually on the way out of the city got out of the car and wipe the dust off of his feet. Mm. Uh, if you may, you may recall that that's actually an instruction from Jesus who said, if you go to a place and they reject you, wipe the dust off of your feet. And um, it's not a good sign actually. And that's why Reinhard said he only did it one time, but after Reinhard left that city, the, the governor actually went insane and it was very well known in the region. The governor went insane and actually there was great difficulty. I think famine and some uh, very severe economic things happened in that city um, and the people have been asking us ever since as a ministry to come back. And just recently, one of our evangelists went there and it was an incredible meeting. And we had lots of reports, great testimonies of the way that, that the Lord brought restoration to many lives. And, um, and many of the people there are saying that it was like a, like a, a turnaround. So, um, you know, again, there, there are lots of examples of things like this. There, there've been cities where there's been persecution, there's been cities where the government has has basically run us out. But somehow in, at the end of the day, it always seems like the Holy Spirit gets his way. It always seems like God really wins at the end. So we we just keep pushing forward no matter what the, the trials. Amen. Amen. And that is a lot of like a physical representation of what's happening in the spirit, too. Um, and we're, we're just kind of seeing uh, you know, the, the physical side of things that are happening in the spirit. And so let's just talk about spiritual warfare. And, you know, we're talking about your book, Slaying Dragons. And I love the, the fact that this is a practical guide. You know, sometimes people get so caught up in the mystics and the, the drama of spiritual warfare and casting out demons. And the I think Hollywood has done a really good job of over complicating things. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do we what is spiritual warfare and what isn't spiritual warfare? I guess maybe we can, that might be a decent question to, to get started with that. Well, again, you know, the, the term of spiritual warfare is, it's a difficult thing to define because it is an analogy. 
you know, we're not literally picking up weapons and, you know, trying to attack some entity. You know, I know that sometimes you have intercessors or in some charismatic circles, they'll, they will literally do physical things that look like they're fighting some invisible foe. Okay. And, you know, at the end of the day, our fight is not actually, it's not like we're shadow boxing. It's not that we're exerting physical energy to, you know, um, to overcome some opponent. What it is, is that we're fighting very often, first of all, with ourselves. Now, this mm. is not to say that there is no external war with entities, because as I quoted earlier, the Apostle Paul says there are uh, principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, but they very often are influencing us through our own minds. So the Correct. battle very often for a believer rages first and primarily between the ears. This is really where the battlefield is. And you find that if you can win the battle here, the enemy can do all kinds of things externally and have very little power over you. He can, you know, just like with the story of Job, the enemy in that story was able to do many things to Job on the outside. But only Job was in charge of the way that he handled that situation internally. And the greater battle was the way that it was fought internally. This is the way it is for believers. So we talk about what is spiritual warfare. You know, a lot of people have in mind things like casting out devils, which obviously that's a part of it, or, right, you know, right. bringing down uh, principalities that are over a region and, and things like that. Those are very dramatic ideas. But, but very often to me, what spiritual warfare looks like is discipline, hmm. integrity. Um, you know, one of the things I write about in the book is that I think one of the most profound spiritual warfare passages in the Bible is the Sermon on the Mount. Why? Because in the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus does is he paints a picture that of, of a reality, of a kingdom that operates in a way that is totally contrary to the kingdom of darkness. Hmm. It is a way of thinking. It is a way of living. It is a way of believing that is contrary to everything that is natural in some ways. And so it's difficult to be able to walk in the spirit in this way and to maintain that way of thinking. It's actually kind of like a war. It's kind of like a battle. It's a battle with our flesh. The apostle Paul talks about how he buffets or he beats his body every day to keep it into subjection. Now, again, that's an analogy. He's not literally whipping his back or something, but he's talking about the internal struggle to keep the heart and the mind aligned. He uses imagery like how he casts down imaginations and every thought, every argument that exalts itself against the, the knowledge of God. These are, these are images that evoke some uh, idea of violence. But again, it's not physical violence. What it is, it's the internal battle to keep one's heart and mind aligned with the things of God. And if we can master that, that's why in this, in this book, I spend a great deal of time dealing with that internal battle and how to be victorious there. Because if we can get our internal situation aligned correctly, then we're able to have great authority in, in the external world. Jesus said, the, the prince of this world has come, but he's found nothing in me. Mm -hmm. You know, the enemy had no right to Jesus because his heart, his spirit, his mind, his life internally was completely and perfectly aligned with the will of God. So when it came time for him to cast out demons, it wasn't even a struggle. Just one word and those demons had to go because Jesus himself was perfectly submitted to the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's a reason that the, wow. that the process is put in that order. It doesn't say resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is what a lot of people don't understand. They start just rebuking the devil or pleading the blood of Jesus over some demon-possessed person, and they wonder why they, they end up in a situation where actually they sometimes, like the seven sons of Siva, are actually worse off at the end of that encounter than at the beginning. The reality is that the, the order has got to be right. First of all, we have to be submitted unto God. And so that means that that matter of submission is actually a, a, a matter of one's own heart and one's own internal alignment. Once that has happened, so now internally I'm completely submitted to God and aligned with God's will. Now what I can do is I can impose that alignment on the external world because I'm aligned internally. Does that make sense? So yeah, first yeah. submit yourselves to God, then resist the devil. And then if you're submitted to God and you resist the devil, there will be authority and he will flee from you. Amen. Amen. You know, in, in this book, which uh, you could, everybody can get at mycharismashop.com. And I'm going to put the link 
in the comments right now to this video so you can check that out. Um, the uh, <clears throat> talk about a you talk about this this chapter is of killing your pet dragon. Can we talk about what a pet dragon is? Because I don't know anybody that actually has a physical pet dragon, but I think I know where you're I know where you're going with that. But uh, yeah. let's talk about the importance of killing that pet dragon. Well, you know, um, again, when we talk about a dragon or the book is called Slaying Dragons and it's in the context of spiritual warfare, we're usually thinking then of some big, um, scary, very obvious monster that right. we're battling with. And so we, we can talk about those things in, in the, you know, the macro context, but in the, in the context of our own lives, you know, you think about things like drug addiction or pornography addiction or you know, who, who knows what it is, alcoholism or um, just unfaithfulness in different areas or discipline problems, whatever it is, it's some big dragon that you're battling with, that you're fighting with. Those things always start out very small. And when they start, they very rarely seem to us to be the dragons that they ultimately become. So I, I told the story in the book of a, a newspaper article that I read about in a British newspaper where a guy bought a rock python he uh, ironically named him Tiny. This mm -hmm. python grew to be something like, I, I forget what it was, like 14 feet long or something. Started out as a little tiny snake he could probably hold in one hand that he bought from the pet shop. This python grows to 14 feet long and then ends up killing the guy in his sleep. And I thought it was um, a bit of an interesting analogy that so very often the things that end up killing people in the end are pets that they have raised since they were very young mm -hmm. and they, they could have when those things were young and when those things were small and when those things didn't have a lot of power over those people, they could have shut the door quickly. They could have dealt with those things. They could have repented. They could have cut them out of their lives in a very aggressive way. But instead they said, Oh, this is not a very big deal. This is a small sin. And so they, they were very lenient with it. They coddled it. They didn't pay much attention to it, but over time, those things begin to grow and they grow in such a way like your kids, you know, your kids, they're, they're born and you turn around one day and they're 18 years old and they're six feet tall. And you say, well, when did that happen? Well, it happened one day at a time. It happened in very small, slow, incremental steps. So slow, in fact, that very often you didn't even notice it happening until right. you look back and you go, what in the world is this? And so for a lot of people, even for believers, the, the big dragons that they fight start out as small eggs. So if you have a big dragon in your life, it may require a serious battle. But what I was trying to talk about in that chapter about killing your pet dragon is what about those things that are not dragons yet? Mm -hmm. They're not big, daunting, overwhelming, insurmountable obstacles yet. They might be in 20 years, but today they're small. Today they're in that egg form and you could actually destroy them and you could get them out. You could repent of them. You could be delivered of them very quickly and very easily if you would take care of business today. But if you wait and you let this thing drag out, you could be dealing with something that could destroy your life and the lives of people that you love in the end. So if you let your pet dragon continue to grow, you are not only allowing something that's eventually going to kill you continue to grow, but you're, you're really also hindering the power of the Holy Spirit within you to operate in the fullness that, that God has for your purpose. Um, you're, you're really handicapping yourself. I guess that, I guess you could say that, um, when I know you just had the evangelism boot camp start yesterday and, um, you know, you've got a, a bunch of boot campers that are on fire for Jesus and they want to make an impact for the Lord, but you're going through, they're going through this process right now where they're getting it trained and equipped. Um, how do you take somebody that, you know, they're, they're just like, I want to be used by God. Um, but they are, they just can't kill their pet dragon. Well, you know, just to come back to something that you said a moment ago, I think very often, you know, the Holy Spirit, unlike us, he knows the future hmm. and he knows the things that are in our lives that are going to become problems for us down the road. And I, I really do believe that because of that, he is there convicting us and warning us and giving us the tools that we need to be able to to free ourselves from those kind of bondages. So when a person coddles those pet dragons and raises those pet dragons, one thing that is also happening at the same time is that there is a certain refusal to obey the voice of the Holy Spirit and a, and a hardening of the heart towards the Holy Spirit, which may even be a bigger problem 
than the dragon itself. Because, you know, we, if we quench the, the voice of the Holy Spirit and we harden our hearts, we come to a place where we become immune to his voice. On the, you know, when, you, when it comes to people like the boot camp students or others, I really think that the key is to learn to be submitted to the voice of the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, th this is kind of like, it's the secret ingredient to the Christian life. This is what makes Christianity different from every religion in the world. All the religions are about, here's a book. This book tells you how you ought to be. Now you work really hard to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Christianity is different. The author of the book says, let me come live on the inside of you. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to live through you. If you will yield to me, I will live through you in such a way that I'll fulfill everything on the page. And so Amen. the Christian life is not lived from the outside in. The Christian life is lived from the inside out. So how do you teach someone to kill their pet dragons? You teach them to be submitted to and sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the ace up our, all of our sleeves. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, right now there's um, actually our, our last print issue of, of Charisma magazine. We're now completely digital. And so we're able to give a lot more um, videos and, and links and shares and everything all, all with that. But our last issue, we dealt a lot with deliverance and we featured mm -hmm. people that, that are heavy into deliverance ministry. Um, I know that that's something that uh, there's a bit of a debate about, you know, demonic possession versus oppression. Um, what is, I, I know you've cast out a lot of demons and uh, you dealt with uh, lying spirits too. So um, could you just talk about casting out demons and, and really the importance of deliverance too? Yeah. And, you know, this is an interesting subject to get into because I have dealt with this a lot. I do see a lot of things out there that tend to sensationalize the issue of deliverance. Uh, for me, very often deliverance is quite a simple and undramatic experience. Um, you can now, that doesn't mean that you can't make a show out of demonized situations. There, there are people when they have a, a demon, there are ways to get that thing to go crazy, to talk back. I don't, I don't like devils talking back to me and I don't like to give them my platform or my microphone. My goal is to shut them up and get them out as quickly as possible. I think the, the caution, though, is that casting out devils and deliverance is exciting. And it draws people's attention. Um, you want to talk about this because it's going to get people to watch your you know, social media channel or watch your video or whatever. But the reality is that if you dive into this area of deliverance without the first part that I talked about earlier, which is being submitted to God, you are actually setting yourself up for uh, a very dangerous situation because, uh, again, I referenced the se seven sons of Sceva. These were people who they knew the formula to cast out devils, but they didn't actually know the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so I think what in the back of the book here, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a cheat code for the <laughs> ones that haven't read it yet. But in the back of the book, I have a chapter that's called How to Cast Out Devils. And I, I give you basically a formula that works. A step-by-step -step instruction, here's how you cast out a demon. And it works wonderfully. And it's, it's actually the way that I would suggest, especially people that are uh, just beginning in, in that kind of deliverance ministry, it's what I suggest that they use for many different reasons. But there's a reason that I put it at the end of the book instead of the beginning. I know it's the mm -hmm. part a lot of people want to read. Right, but I right. really felt like it was important that you got all this stuff first because this is what shows you about how to submit yourself to God and to keep yourself internally aligned with him. And that's what protects you because there will be people, according to the, the very words of Jesus, that will cast out devils and do wonderful works in the name of Jesus. And Jesus will look at them and say, who are you? Not only that, he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. So just the ability to cast out devils shouldn't be what we are excited about and what's turning us on in, in, in spiritual matters. Jesus said, don't rejoice that, that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what I would say, even though I, it, deliverance is very important, it is a part of the ministry of Jesus. It ought to be a part of all of our ministries as men and women of God and men and women of the Spirit. But at the, at the beginning and first and foremost, there ought to be um, that internal alignment with the things of God and that submission to His will. Yeah, and that submission to His will and being in alignment um, 
uh, I'm gonna, we're going to divert a little bit, but I want to just talk about uh, the, the Holy Spirit, because I, I love how um, you and Pastor Russ have, have said at church uh, many times that the Holy Spirit isn't weird. We make the Holy Spirit weird or we mm. make we make the presence of the Holy Spirit weird. And it's it's really on us. Um, can we just talk about that a little bit? And we've got about five minutes left and I'm going to ask you to pray for those that are watching at the end sure. of this, but can we just talk about that, the need for the infilling of the Holy spirit and how it doesn't have to be weird? Well, you know, just to, just to clarify, um, when the Holy spirit moves upon people, there are times where people react in such a way that looks strange. I'm not, I'm not denying that at all. And so, you know, when we say the Holy spirit isn't weird, that is an absolute, absolutely true statement. But at the same time, sometimes when he touches people, they act in a way that would appear <laughs> to a casual observer to be weird. Right. But at the same time, I think it's a mistake to relegate the work of the Holy Spirit to these you know, certain kinds of experiences that are valid experiences. These, these times when people experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in very near, tangible, sometimes even physical ways where their bodies react and so forth. It's not just about those kind of manifestations. There is no such thing as Christianity without the Holy Spirit. The New Testament knows nothing of a Christian who is not filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes in the Pentecostal and charismatic world, <clears throat> we unintentionally have created this distinction between those that are saved and those that are filled with the Holy Spirit. And of course, when a Pentecostal uses the terminology of being filled with the Holy Spirit, they have something very specific in mind. But it's important to understand biblically that if you are a Christian, if you are a believer, you have received the Holy Spirit. And now there is the invitation to enter into a life that is filled with the working and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit for the sake of touching the world around us. And that's not just some incidental add-on cherry on top of the cake of Christianity. The way that that is represented in the New Testament and specifically in the book of Acts, that powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit for ministry is part of the very purpose that Jesus came, why he died. It's not some separate thing that's just for a couple different denominations. It's for all believers that we are filled with the Holy Spirit to the point that the power of the Spirit is working through us, reaching the lost and dying world around us for the sake of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> I appreciate that because, you know, we we really need that, that power of the Holy Spirit in us. And I know we've got just like two minutes left. And I'm just going to ask you, um, you know, you're, you're an evangelist and uh, I think we would be missing a great opportunity if I didn't ask you to share the gospel and, and lead somebody to Christ right now. Uh, I'd, I'd love to do that. And if you're watching this video and you've made it this far, um, I would imagine if you're not a believer and you've watched this much of the video, there's something happening to you right now that the Holy Spirit is actually working on you. What am I, what do I mean by that? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So if you feel that drawing, even to just keep watching this video, there's something going on on the inside of you. That is the Holy Spirit who's drawing you to the foot of the cross. I, I was just talking to somebody about this earlier today, that when it comes to the gospel, really what it's about is an exchange. We read in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that it says, that he made him, that's God, made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So it, there's a picture here of an exchange that's taking place. There's, there's humanity, which is sinful. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. It says that all we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us have turned to our own way. So the Bible paints a picture of humanity that is not basically good. It is basically fallen, and it's born and steeped in sin. And there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to remedy that situation. The situation is so extreme, in fact, that our only hope was for God himself to step into the equation and to do the work himself. And so that's what Jesus did. He came, he was born to a virgin named Mary. He lived a sinless life. He died at 33 years of age. And the Bible says that he died the death of a criminal, even though he had done nothing wrong. He had never sinned. He'd never had a bad thought. He'd never lied. He'd never cheated. He'd, he'd literally never given in to temptation one time in his life, yet he died the most brutal, most horrific death imaginable, the death of a criminal. Why was that? Well, the, the, the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus loved 
me and gave himself for me. Jesus died for my sins, the sins, the, the, the death penalty that I should have had, he took in my place. And so what's happening here is he's saying, if you will give me your sin, I will give you my righteousness. If you will give me your punishment, I will give you my pardon. It's this exchange that goes on. It's not a matter of doing better and trying harder. It's a matter of accepting that free gift of salvation. And there's a great analogy for this that, that I love to use. M imagine the scene. Imagine that there is a man who has been on a, on a shipwreck, and now there is floating debris all over the place, and this man is holding on to a waterlogged piece of driftwood that is slowly beginning to sink. And the lifeguard is called to the scene, and they race up, and they throw a life preserver over the edge with a rope attached to it, and they throw it to that man, and they say, take a hold of this life preserver. It sounds like a very easy thing to do, except that this man has been holding on to this waterlogged piece of driftwood for a long time. It has been the thing that has kept him going all this time. And in order to take a hold of that life preserver, he's going to have to let go of that to which he has been clinging for his salvation. Now, here's the reality. That piece of driftwood is going to sink anyway. At, at the end of the day, that driftwood cannot save him. It may keep him afloat a few more minutes or a few more hours, but ultimately, unless he takes hold of that life preserver, he is going to die. And so what he's going to have to do is let one go and he's gonna have to take the other one. The Bible says, repent. That means turn away from everything else that you've been putting your trust in and believe the gospel. That means take hold of the solution, it, the offer of eternal life that comes from Jesus. And so what does that look like? For a lot of people, what have you been putting your trust and your confidence and your hope in? For some people, they've been putting it in their righteousness. I remember talking to a, a cab driver uh, who was a, a man of another religion. And I, I asked him if he knew that he was going to heaven when he died. And he said, yes. I said, how do you know that? He said, well, I believe that when I stand before the almighty, he's going to compare my bad deeds against my good deeds. And he said, I believe my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. And so I will go to heaven. Well, what was that? That was this man putting his confidence for his eternal salvation into the deeds that he had done that were good. He was trusting his own good works to save him. Some people are trusting their religion. Some people are trusting their pastor. Some people are, are trusting their um, philosophy. Some people are, are leaning on their own wisdom and their own intuition. Whatever it is that you are holding on to that's giving you hope, the Bible says, let that thing go and take hold of the only thing between heaven and earth that can save you. That is the nail-pierced hand of Jesus Christ. He'll save you. He'll pull you out of that boiling ocean. He'll set your feet upon the solid rock. And he will say this to you, as it says in the scriptures, because I live, you shall live also. That's the exchange. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so if that's the desire that you have, and you're listening to this right now, and you say, Daniel, I want to do that. I want to put my trust in Jesus. I want to take hold of that life preserver. This is not very difficult. It's a matter of shifting in your heart. Repent. That means change the way you've been thinking and living and believing and believe the gospel. Cling to Christ. If you want to do that, I want to pray with you. And I, I'll just clarify that this is not um, some kind of magic incantation. I'm not, I'm, I'm not reciting some particular words that have the power to save you. All that I'm doing is I'm going to help you to verbalize and to articulate the cry of your own heart. But you have to understand that God is listening to your heart. So when you pray this with me, if that's your desire, don't just repeat the words, but really from your heart, cry out to the Lord and say something like this. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear I come Lord to Jesus, you right now as a sinner. I come to you right now as I, a sinner. I need salvation. I need salvation. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. Save me now. Save me now. I put my hope in you. I put my hope in you. I confess with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. What I believe in my heart. What I believe in my heart. That you died on the cross for me. That you died on the cross for me. That you rose from the dead for me. That you rose from the dead for me. That you are the king of kings. That you are the king of kings. And you are the Lord of my life. And you are the Lord of my life. From this day forward. From this day forward, I belong to Jesus. I believe I belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to me. And Jesus belongs to me. I believe it. I believe it. I receive it. I receive it. I confess it. I confess it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And let me say one more thing: If you prayed that prayer with me sincerely, and you really called out to the Lord and put your trust in Him, the Bible says that you have been born again into the family of God. Now, this is not the end. This is the beginning of the journey. 
So there's three things I want to ask you to do. Number one, get a Bible and begin to read that Bible every day. Number two, begin to pray every single day. What is prayer? It's just simply talking to God as you would talk to a friend. Number three, I want you to reach out to a Bible-believing church, get connected in a place where the Bible is being taught, where there are Christian brothers and sisters around that are going to help you to grow day by day in the things of God. And I can promise you this, the best days of your life are still ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been talking with Pastor Daniel Kalenda, Evangelist Daniel Kalenda from Christ for All Nations, and the author of Slaying Dragons, which you can get at mycharismashop.com. And uh, the link for that is in the uh, is in the the is in the comments below. And so I just definitely recommend checking that book out. And I listened to the audiobook. Um, and there's extra sections in this particular uh, special edition too. So, uh, Pastor Daniel, thank you so much for being here uh, on this Charisma Connection. It's been great having you. Hold on just one moment. I just got to make this special announcement uh, that Charisma Magazine is now going exclusively online. So check this out and uh, we'll see you next time. From 1975, Charisma has been at the forefront of reporting on revival, miracles, and the move of God in our world. Charisma Magazine is now going exclusively online to reach beyond the physical barriers of a print issue. Charisma Magazine Online is committed to bringing you the very best spirit-led content to inspire your walk with God in this upside-down world. Go to MyCharisma.com for exclusive content today.